Would you please turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, and we shall read from verse 43, Matthew, chapter 5, from verse 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect perfect. Well, we come in our studies in the Sermon on the Mount to the end of the third section. The third section is dealing with the righteousness of God's kingdom. It begins in chapter 5, 17, and it runs to the end of the chapter. And we have seen that after laying down some general principles, our Lord then gives six examples in which he contrasts the standards of the scribes and the Pharisees, the inherited tradition of the elders, he contrasts that with the standards of God's kingdom. Last week, we saw him doing it in relation to the principle of self, me and my rights. And we saw that the Pharisees took a verse of the Old Testament, which was for the judges to implement in the courts of law, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, and they were clearly turning it into a personal rule of life. Stand up for yourself. Demand your rights. If someone wrongs you, bring the full weight of the law against him. That was the outlook of the scribes and the Pharisees. By contrast, our Lord says, do not resist an evil person. Do not retaliate against personal insults, the slap on the face. That is not a violent attack upon the person, it is a mere insult. Do not respond, says Jesus. Don't get involved in needless legal disputes. If someone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, well, that is a small enough matter. He's not suing you for your house or your car. He is not suing you in such a way that you are going to be brought to financial ruin. It is a small enough matter. Let him have it rather than get into litigation and contention of that kind. Go with him the second mile. Give more than the legal requirement and be generous to others. Don't have this attitude of what's mine belongs to me. Rather, have a concern for others. Give to those who ask if they are in genuine need, and from him who wants to borrow in real need, then give him, do not turn him away. And all of this, all of this clearly relates closely to one of the most fundamental precepts of the Old Testament, which is 
you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so now in the sixth and last example, our Lord goes on to speak about the way in which the scribes and the Pharisees perverted and abused even that plain exhortation. And so we come to verse 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, the first part of that saying is in the Bible. You shall love your neighbor. The words and hate your enemy are nowhere in the Bible. They had added that because they thought it was a kind of logical addition to the first part. Well, let's begin by looking at the first part that is in the Bible, and we find it in exactly these words in Leviticus 19, verse 18. Leviticus 19, 18 reads, You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge, against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now notice that this verse uh, relates very closely to the two examples that we are, have been looking at. Our Lord in the previous example of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, he has been talking about not taking vengeance, non-retaliation. And this verse says, you shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Not taking vengeance is the negative you shall, if you like, hold back, restrain yourself from taking vengeance. The positive is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, these two examples with which our Lord concludes relate very closely to the first and to the second part of Leviticus 19.18. Now, in... Uh, that verse, Leviticus 19.18, it says, You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. When he speaks about the children of your people, it is in the context clearly talking about fellow Israelites rather than speaking about Gentiles. And this was a kind of legal loophole, if you like, that was being used by the scribes and the Pharisees. Ah, it says you shall love your neighbor, but your neighbor is to be limited to the children of your people. That means our fellow countrymen a man of the same religion. That is the person that we are commanded to love. That person and that person alone. Well, in a kind of strictly legalistic interpretation of Leviticus 19, that might be true. That is indeed who he is talking about, but there's an obvious reason for that. The book of Leviticus is given to regulate life in Israel. It's dealing with how God's people are to relate one to another as members of this covenant community, the people of God. But that by no means implies that their behavior can be quite different when they're dealing with a foreigner. For example, if you turn for a moment to Leviticus 19, and uh, look at verse 
11. It says, You shall not steal, nor deal falsely, nor lie to one another. Okay, now in the context, it's speaking to the Israelites. If you want to take a legalistic interpretation of that, it is saying you shall not steal or deal falsely or lie to your fellow countrymen, to the other people of God. But does anyone seriously think that God is saying, but of course you can steal and you can deal falsely and you can lie to a man so long as he's not an Israelite? That is an absurd way to understand that verse. And uh, verse 13 says, You shall not cheat your neighbor nor rob him. Again, in the context, no doubt the neighbor is indeed the fellow member of God's people, the member of the Israelite community. But is God saying to us, but it's perfectly okay to cheat your Gentile neighbor? It's perfectly okay to steal from a man if only he's a Gentile? Clearly, that would be a false interpretation. And when the scribes and the Pharisees said, Ah, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor, therefore my neighbor is only a fellow countryman, a fellow Jew, a fellow believer in the God of Israel, they were clearly distorting the intention of Almighty God. The command of God is intended to apply to Jew and Gentile alike. You shall love your neighbor, whoever he may be. You shall love him as yourself. Notice the great importance of this commandment. When Jesus was asked, which was the great commandment of the law, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And then he adds, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And Jesus is telling us that this is an immensely important commandment. He is telling us that in the last analysis, the entire law boils down to just two things. The love of God with all your being and the love of your neighbor as yourself. The Apostle Paul says the same thing. Romans 13, verse 8, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Paul quotes from what we generally call the second table of the law. The first table refers to the first four commandments. And the first four of the Ten Commandments deal with the love of God. They require exclusive devotion. You shall have no other gods. They require spiritual worship, not by means of idols. They require sincere worship. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And they require that we spend time with God. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. 
and that is all relating to the love of God, and that comes first. But then this fourth commandment about the Sabbath is a kind of bridge between the love of God and the love of man. Because the fourth commandment also touches upon the love of our neighbor. Deuteronomy 5.14 The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your male ser female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. The fourth commandment not only has a Godward aspect, you shall keep the day holy, it also has a manward aspect that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. There is a humanitarian element in this. And then, once we go beyond that to the fifth commandment onwards, the Ten Commandments are dealing entirely with our relationship to our fellow men. Respect for those in authority. Honor your father and your mother. Respect for your neighbor's life. You shall not kill. Respect for his marriage. You shall not commit adultery. Respect for his property. You shall not steal. Respect for his right to the truth. You shall not bear false witness. And even to your inward, internal attitude to your neighbor and his well-being. You shall not covet what belongs to your neighbor. And all of these can be summed up in this single saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, it is therefore a tremendously important commandment. It is one of the fundamental commandments. If you like, it's one of the root commandments out of which the others grow. This is the great principle. The other commandments are simply application in various specific details. It is a fundamental commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. It is one half of the entirety of the law of God. Well, what did the scribes and the Pharisees make of this so important commandment? They did two things. First of all, as I've already touched upon, they quibbled about who this neighbor might be. Do you remember our Lord had to deal with this in Luke chapter 10? when a lawyer came to him and he came with the question, uh, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus throws the question back to him and he says, Well, what's, what do you think? Or what do you read in the law? What does the law say about it? And the lawyer answers, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says to him, you've answered rightly, do this and you shall live. And at this point, it's clear that the man's conscience is touched because although he can give an exact and correct answer to the question about the law, he knows in his heart that he falls very far short of that. And when Jesus says, you're right, do it and you will live, conscience begins to prick and he wants to, to justify himself and so his question is and who is my neighbor? And that was undoubtedly a much debated question among these people. They did not want to concede that any fellow human being was our neighbor. They wanted to limit it either to our fellow Jews 
or even it's possible that the Pharisees may even have gone to the extreme of saying, no, it only refers to our fellow Pharisees. Even the common Jews are not to be regarded as worthy of this love. And so they quibbled and they tried to narrow down the focus, who is my neighbor? And then, not only did they do that, but they also added to this commandment, they said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And to them, that seemed quite reasonable and logical. It was not there in the Bible, but they thought it was okay. Well, what does the Old Testament actually say about our attitude towards our enemies? It has to be admitted, I think, it has to be admitted that there is a good deal in the Old Testament which on the face of it might lend support to the Pharisaic interpretation. Two things in particular that might lead to you thinking that, well, maybe that is what the Old Testament teaches. First of all, there was the command to exterminate the Canaanites. Joshua was commanded by God to go into the promised land to utterly destroy the Canaanite nations. And there is some pretty extreme language used. It is clear that they were to spare nobody. Men, women, old people, children, babies, the lot. They were to be exterminated utterly from the land. That might certainly seem to justify the addition, you shall hate your enemy. And then secondly, there are various passages in the Psalms where we are reading and sometimes we may be quite startled suddenly to come across a prayer against enemies, praying that God will judge them and do terrible things to them. And again, we may feel that as we read the Old Testament that there is some justification for this scribal addition and hate your enemy. Well, what are we to make of these things? First of all, let's think for a moment about the Canaanites. How can we explain this commandment to exterminate the Canaanites? We have to begin with this great principle that God is just. On the day of judgment, God is going to judge the world in absolute righteousness. And the Bible makes it clear that there will be a time when the day of mercy will be over. And for those who have not sought and found the mercy and the forgiveness of God, it will be too late. Jesus himself teaches this. He teaches it in the parables which speak about, for example, the foolish virgins. They, they go off to, to buy oil and they come back and they find that the door is already shut. And they knock, but the door will not open. It is too late. The time for judgment has come. And they have not sought mercy while it was to be found. And the Bible speaks, and it's the New Testament that speaks about it, about men receiving judgment without mercy for those who have shown no mercy. And we have to recognize that a day of judgment is coming when the day of mercy, the day of grace, will be passed. And God will judge with absolute justice and righteousness those who have never sought the salvation of Christ. But you see, the Bible also teaches that in a real sense, there have already been certain days of judgment in the history of this world. 
One such day was the flood, when God said, I have had enough of the human race. I will blot out all flesh from before me. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and God instructed Noah to build the ark, to take his family with him, to take representative samples of the various um, creatures of the animal kingdom and so on. And then God wiped out the rest of the human race. The day of mercy for them was over. All flesh, we read, had corrupted its way before God. The earth was filled with violence. And there came a time when God said, enough is enough. And for them, for the people of that day, their day of mercy was over. And for them, the time had come for judgment without mercy. And then in a more limited way, it came again to the Canaanite nations. It had been foretold by God 400 years earlier to Abraham that your seed will go down into the land of Egypt and then in due course in the fourth generation, which seems here to mean after about 400 years, they will return to this land. God says, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. In other words, God was still giving them time. He was giving them another 400 years in which to repent, to seek God, but they did not. They continued in their outrageously evil ways, and we know from other sources that the iniquity of these Canaanite nations was gross and extreme. And God said that for these nations, the day of mercy was over. The day of judgment had come. And Joshua and the people of Israel were the executioners of God's judgment upon these nations. And what we have to understand is that the ethics of the conquest were not the ethics of the rest of the Bible. They were the ethics of the day of judgment. Here was something utterly exceptional. Here was God acting in awful judgment upon people who had exceeded all the limits and who now were to have judgment without mercy. But there is, for example, in Deuteronomy, a perfectly clear distinction drawn between an ordinary war and the treatment of your enemy in an ordinary war and the treatment of the Canaanites in the wars of conquest. There were principles of mercy and humanitarianism to be operated even in times of war, at ordinary times, but not in dealing with the Canaanites. It was something quite exceptional. They were nations upon whom God had already pronounced final judgment. And then we have the imprecatory psalms, those psalms in which there are these prayers for judgment upon his enemies. And we have to make these comments. First of all, these are not simply personal enemies who are in view. The psalmist is never praying for simply his personal opponents. These are the enemies of God. And it is made clear that these are God's enemies. They are people who hate God. They are people who hate the people of God, and they are people who have set themselves to destroy the people of God. And it is against these that the psalmist prays. Moreover, what he prays for is for vindication, that God would vindicate his own people against the assaults and the injustice of these enemies. He prays for justice 
He prays for deliverance. And none of these things need imply any degree of hatred on the part of the psalmist. Most of the references to hatred in the Old Testament are to the fact that these enemies hate the people of God and are persecuting the innocent and are behaving unreasonably and implacably. And against such people, prayers to God that God would in vindicate his people and deliver them and execute judgment upon these oppressors, they are perfectly proper without any necessary implication that there was any personal hatred involved. Let's just go back in history for a moment here in, the, here in Manila to the Second World War and to the Japanese occupation of Manila and to the terrible, terrible things that took place at the hands of the Japanese aggressors. I am sure that there must have been Christians here in Manila who prayed that God would deal with the aggressor. Who prayed that God would bring them to judgment, would bring justice, that he would bring deliverance for the oppressor, for, for the oppressed. And that would have been a perfectly proper prayer. That did not necessarily imply the smallest degree of personal hatred for any particular Japanese soldier, but it was prayer against this evil which they were faced with. There are, sometimes in the Old Testament, there are occasional expressions of actual hatred. Psalm 139. Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. We need to consider in what sense he can mean that. It is not wrong to hate what an evil person is and what he does. To love our enemies cannot mean that we are to love the character and the actions of evil men. Do you think that Christians living in Nazi Germany were to love Adolf Hitler? They were. You shall love your neighbor. He was their neighbor. Yes, they were to love Hitler. Does that mean that they were to love Hitler's character and to love the things that he was doing? God forbid. That would be utterly impossible. No Christian could ever love the character, the evil of Hitler or any of his henchmen. And there is a difference between hating evil men in the sense of hating what they are, hating what they stand for, and bearing any kind of personal hatred which simply arises out of the ill that he has done to me. Concerning personal enemies, the Old Testament is very clear. Exodus 23, verse 4, If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, what are you to do? You shall surely bring it back to him. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under its burden, and you would refrain from helping him, you shall surely help him with it. Here you, you find that your enemy his donkey has collapsed under the burden and you pass by and in your heart you say, ha, I don't want to help him. The law says you shall help him. He may be your enemy, but he is a man in need. You shall help him. Proverbs 24, 17, Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. Do not let your heart be glad 
when he stumbles. Proverbs 25, 21, If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. And the Old Testament teaching on our personal enemies as opposed to the evil character of those who implacably hate God and his people, the Old Testament teaching is clear. If your enemy is in trouble, help him. Do him good. Even though, at a personal level, he may hate you. We see examples of this in the Old Testament. In particular, we see it in King David, in his response to Saul's aggression. Saul was David's enemy. Not because David hated him, but because Saul had decided to be the enemy of David. It was Saul who was the aggressor. On two occasions, he had taken his javelin and tried to pin David to the wall. How did David respond when he had Saul at his mercy, he showed mercy. He could have killed Saul. He could have ended Saul's life immediately and made his escape. He refused to do it. And listen to what Saul himself says about this. These are Saul's words to King David. You are more righteous than I, for you have rewarded me with good whereas I rewarded you with evil. And you have shown this day how you have dealt well with me. For when the Lord delivered you into my hand, in, delivered me into your hand, you did not kill me. If a man finds his enemy, will he let him get away safely? May the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. These are the words of Saul himself, recognizing that the man to whom he had shown such enmity, such animosity, the man he had tried to kill, had been gracious in return. He had rewarded evil with good. And that is the Old Testament position. And it was entirely unjustified when the scribes and the Pharisees added to the biblical exhortation, you shall love your neighbor, when they said, yes, and hate your enemy. Well, we come to the teaching of Jesus himself. Notice that there is a difference in verse 44, according to which Bible, you may, or which version of the Bible, I should say, which version of the Bible you have in front of you. In the King James, in the New King James Version, we read, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. If you're using the English Standard Version or the New American Standard Bible or the NIV, they are much shorter in this verse. simply says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Why the difference? Well, it is simply that in the large number of Greek manuscripts which exist, there are some which support the longer reading. There are some which support the shorter. Now, this is not a matter which should trouble us. We do find variations of this kind in the New Testament. It is exceedingly difficult to determine which reading is the original. But we can say with great emphasis that not one of these variations affects any significant point of Christian doctrine. We should be profoundly thankful to God that we do not need to be sure about which particular school of textual criticism we are going to follow in order to know the truth. Because whether you use the English Standard Version, whether you use the New King James Version, 
the doctrine which you will learn is the same from both. And God has not permitted significant and important differences in the manuscripts. Now, in this particular case, we can compare it with Luke chapter 26 and 27, where there is no variation in the manuscripts, no variation in the Bible versions, and these verses contain everything that Jesus says here. So whether it's the case that Matthew left out some phrases that Jesus actually spoke, or whether it's the case that scribes have simply imported into Matthew's gospel um, oh, phrases from Luke, we cannot be sure, but the one thing we can be sure about is that everything that's in this verse, in the New King James Version, was spoken by the Lord Jesus. We need not distress our minds in the least degree about these small variations. We can be sure that everything that was spoken, that is recorded here in the longer version in um, Matthew 5:44 in the New King James Version, everything that is there was certainly said by Jesus, whether or not it should be in this precise place in uh, Matthew's Gospel. So I will proceed on the basis that we'll follow here the New King James Version. I just wanted those of you with other versions to understand where these phrases are coming from. So in verse 44, but I say to you, Again, Jesus takes upon himself authoritatively to correct the traditions of the elders. He appeals simply to his own authority. It was said by the elders of old, but I say to you. He speaks by his own authority as the Son of God. But I say to you, Love your enemies. This is the very antithesis, the very opposite of the scribal teaching and practice, and it's the very antithesis of the common practice of mankind. Men and women naturally love their own people. They love their own family. They love their own race. They love those of their own religion. But Jesus says, love your enemies and this is different Jesus is speaking of a universal love for all mankind including even those who hate you and who do evil to you do not respond with hatred Jesus says on your part you are to respond to hatred with love what does it mean to love our enemy? Well, Jesus is clearly telling us that the command, you shall love your neighbor, includes our enemy. Our enemy is our neighbor. And we are to love our enemy as yourself. How do we love ourselves? we are tremendously concerned about our own well-being. That's not wrong. That is something natural and right. We care about ourselves. We care about our physical and temporal well-being. If we have become Christians, we care about our spiritual well-being. We care about ourselves. Not only do we care but we act upon that concern. This is not a mere feeling. I feel that I love myself. We actually act upon our love for ourselves. It's a love that expresses itself in action. And all of us, we naturally seek our own well-being with diligence and with constancy. And Jesus is telling us 
to love our enemy in the same way. We are to be concerned, we are to have a care for his overall well-being, his temporal well-being, his physical well-being, his spiritual well-being. We are to have a care for that. And not only so, but we are to act upon that concern. Not a vague wish, but a real love that expresses itself in action, and we are to do it diligently and constantly, just as we do towards ourselves. And therefore, Jesus goes on to say, bless those who curse you. Do not be controlled by what your enemy is doing. Don't retaliate and seek to do to him as he is doing to you. Rather, when he curses you, respond by blessing. When he wants to hurt you, respond by seeking his well-being. Do good to those who hate you. Don't be controlled by what he is. Don't become like him by hating him back. You are to put love into action and you are to do him good. This reminds me very much of our Lord's words in relation to the, the parable of the Good Samaritan when the lawyer first of all gives the, the answer you shall love the Lord your God, you shall love your neighbor as yourself and Jesus says you are right, do this, do it and you shall live. And then after he's asked this question about my neighbor and our Lord has told the parable of the Good Samaritan and then he asks, well, who was neighbor to the man who fell among thieves? And very reluctantly the lawyer replies, well, I suppose it was the one who showed mercy. Jesus again says, you have answered correctly, go and do likewise. Jesus is not talking about something vague and theoretical. He is not talking about mere sentiment, something that we simply profess, oh yes, we love even our enemies. Jesus is talking about loving them in a practical way that we actually do them good. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Prayer is an expression of desire. You cannot pray for what you do not sincerely desire. And so when Jesus tells us to pray for these people, he is emphasizing that we are to have a genuine heartfelt desire for the well-being of this man who is an enemy. We are not only outwardly to do him good, outwardly to, to bless and so on, but in our hearts we are sincerely to desire this man's well-being. He is our enemy by his own doing, by his own decision, but we will not respond in kind. We will love him even as ourselves. That is Jesus' teaching. That is what he is telling us. And then he gives us some motives to do it. The first motive, he says, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. If you do this, he says, you will show yourselves to be children of God. The child loves to be like his father. And the father loves to see the family likeness in his child. And here Jesus is saying, you are to do this in order that you may have and that you may show the family likeness, that you may be like God. How does God treat his enemies? He is good to them. He sends his, he makes his son to rise on the evil and upon the just. He does good. He sends his rain to them 
upon the evil and upon the just. Evil men, their crops are watered by rain sent by the God whom they hate. Their crops grow due to the sunshine sent by the God whom they hate. And Jesus is telling us that we are called to be like our Father. Do men hate you? Do men do evil things to you? Do you have enemies at work? Do you have enemies in society? Jesus says, love them. Do them good. Because in so doing, you will be like your Father. And then the second motive that we may be different from the world. If you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? The Christian is called to be different. We must understand that this Sermon on the Mount calls us from beginning to end. It calls us not to be like the world. It calls us to be different from what we were before we became Christians. To be different from our non-Christian neighbor. It calls us to be the people of God and to be seen in our lives in this world to be the people of God. We see it throughout this sermon. And we are to be different in this matter of whom we love. The world loves its own people. We must be clear about that. The most ungodly men and women are perfectly capable of loving those who love them. They love those who are like themselves. I was reading just a week or two ago about Heinrich Himmler. Himmler was probably the second most powerful man in Nazi Germany. He was in charge of the concentration camps. He was personally responsible for overseeing the brutal murder of millions of Jews and others. He was an evil man. But Himmler had a little daughter. And he was devoted to his little daughter. He loved her intently and she loved him sadly she is still alive today she is nearly 90 and she still thinks the world of her father what a good man he was and she still justifies all that he did and all that Hitler did as well the world is quite capable of loving those who love them it is said that Hitler himself was fond of children. He loved children. But of course, you must understand that the children he loved were fair-skinned, blue-eyed German children. Not anybody else. The world itself is capable of loving their own people. And Jesus says, if that's all that you do, what are you doing more than others? And that is a very pertinent question for us. If you love those who love you, if you love your own family, if you love your own nationality, if you love people from your own culture and background, if you love people of your own outlook, how does that make you different from anybody else? Hitler could do it. Himmler could do it. Everybody can do it. Jesus calls us to be something more than others. To be something different from others. Jesus calls us as Christians to have an outlook, an attitude, which sets us utterly apart from the world. And where in us 
men and women can see something that is not merely human. It is something that comes by the grace of God. The world cannot love its enemies. It hates them. The scribes and the Pharisees added and hate your enemy and so would all the people of this world. They would do the same. We as Christians, we are called to be different. I don't know about you, but as I've studied this passage, there is only one prayer that I feel all able to offer. And it's the prayer of the tax collector. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. May we be convicted. May we be transformed by God's grace. Amen.